Uh, can I um, introduce our next speaker from uh, Central St. Martin's? Uh, it's, uh, I only know you as Matt. No, it's your Matt Malpass. Malpass. And uh, he's going to be talking to us about uh, particularly a, a perspective on the industrial design side of it. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah. Over to you, Matt. Okay, so um, uh, I'm Matt Malpass. I'm, uh, the, I'm in part responsible for the products around the industrial design program uh, here at Central St. Martin's. Uh, and I, I coordinate MA Industrial Design. We've seen some of the, uh, the examples that have come out of MA Industrial Design working with um, Design Against Crime in the past few years. Uh, until recently, I was a, a research fellow within Design Against Crime. Um, uh, my research fellow, I was a research fellow in critical design practice. Um, so I'm sort of uh, approaching this, this question of empathy and restorative justice um, through this lens of critical design. Um, I'm sort of interested, I'll, 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 I'll speak a little bit about what critical design is to those people in the audience that haven't heard of the practice before. Um, but I'm interested in this sort of the relationship between a critical design practice and design led social innovation. Um, in short, both these practices are socially and politically motivated. Um, but in the context of this, of this, this workshop, um, I'm going to focus on this, this idea of the dilemma of interpretation. Um, and the dilemma of interpretation is um, essential in examples of critical design practice, in the functioning of critical design practice. Okay. So just to give you a bit of an idea about the structure, um, I'll introduce what critical design is very, very briefly. Um, I'm going to talk about the purposeful use of ambiguity to generate and facilitate interactions through this dilemma of interpretation. And then sort of play with the question, uh, why is this empathetic and, empathet empathetic and how might it be restorative? Okay. Um, so critical design or critical design practice um, takes a critical perspective on the role of product design in society. Uh, it recognises the ability uh, for the design work to construct publics on and around objects uh, to mobilise debate uh, and engage communities in discussion around the object. Um, critical designers challenge established discourse, institution, knowledge structures, um, and they present alternative roles for product design to those that are driven by technological, fiscal um, concerns. Uh, this interpretation of design counters hegemonic optimistic notions of, uh, of uh, industrial product design and what it's for. Um, and it aims to legitimize and problematize alternative forms of design practice. And it's got a pretty long tradition. Starts in, I'm not going to go into the, the, the history in too much detail. It starts perhaps uh, in, the, in Italy during the sort of late 60s, 70s with collectives such as Super Studio and experiments uh, carried out by the Castiglione brothers. Um, it was popularised in the uh, in the late 90s by the by the work of uh, that came out of the computer related design studio at the Royal College of Art um, uh, and Dun and Raby. Um, an example here where Dun and Raby are looking at sort of the effect of the electromagnetic spectrum and there uh, and how sort of the increased design and delivery of electronic products is sort of creating this new Hertzian landscape their response being this piece of furniture that lets us hide away from this, this, this land, landscape that's potentially um, dangerous. Um, but recently there's been a speculative term, uh, term within this practice where, the, uh, where this critical and speculative design work is looking at how um, design can imagine uh, and challenge um, sort of uh, trends of technological progression. So in this example, James is... Uh, Smile dating project that was carried out, commissioned by um, Phillips. Um, James Auger uh, is looking at the, um, the potential in, in uh, olfactory technology. So this, this, this apparatus allows us to uh, diagnose genetic compatibility with uh, a potential partner. So um, if we smile right, we can have sort of healthy kids. Um, in all these examples, you may notice this sort of this very sort of ambiguous language, they're sort of, they're open to interpretation and it's in that sort of, that, that interpretive space where questions are had uh, uh, and questions are asked over the object and what the object means, how it works, uh, this, it's in that space where people come along and say this is just ridiculous, we wouldn't have it in our life and then somebody says well why not, the technology is being developed in a laboratory, why can't it realise in a domestic setting? 
Um, so they're quite provocative. In this context, we've, had, we've, we've heard today about empathy suits and we've heard about uh, this, this designing for empathy and, and critical designers have played with this. So in this example, Mark Owen's avatar machine, um, Nali ben Hayun uh, is really interested in public engagement with science and technology. And in the, uh, this, this, this example here, the, the Soyuz chair, she wanted to allow people to experience what it's like to take off uh, in, the, uh, in the sort of Soyuz capsule. Um, and she wanted, to do, she wanted to enable you to do this in your living room. So she hacks this, uh, this, this living room chair. She fits it with, uh, with uh, industrial motors, speakers. Um, this is the dinner lady from the Royal College of Arts that she's testing it on. Um, and then she puts this thing into public space. Examples. There's this, 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 this proposed purposeful use of ambiguity. There's this sort of this, this strangely familiar aesthetic. Um, if uh, Nally hadn't just hacked the living room chair, we might have sort of engaged that object differently. We have a different relationship to that object. Uh, to that object. Um, if Tony and Fiona Dunn and Raby didn't talk about the, uh, the the Faraday chair as a piece of furniture. We have a, a different sort of relationship to the object. These objects have got to be located in the familiar. Um, they've got to be located in the everyday, um, uh, and they've got to be framed in a context, in a use context. Um, and this provokes a different set of questions around the object than if it was framed as a piece of or any for, other form of creative practice. So, if Nally's project was fr framed as performance, it might provoke a different set of questions. Uh, if <coughs> The Faraday chair was framed as an artwork, a different set of questions. So framing it in a use context is important. But critical design, I would argue, sits in this peripheral on the edge of, of a disciplinary core. Um, and in such, it's always in flux. What is critical design practice is always in flux. Um, its function is to chip away at the core and to sort of get it to question itself. Its focus can be disciplinary, looking inward and looking outward at broader societal um, concerns, science, technology, whatever. Um, but essential in sort of the examples that I've, showed, I've talked about here is this, is this notion of ambiguity. Now, in a commercial design practice, um, ambiguity is something we don't want, right? Uh, we want to uh, eliminate ambiguity. Um, where the effort of the designer goes into uh, balancing clarity of use um, uh, and reducing interpretation of the product, reduce the ambiguity. And this, this work is, uh, is, is carried out by uh, Bill Gaver, who's written extensively around the, the, the concept of ambiguity in design. Um, and he says the most important benefit, benefit of ambiguity however, is the ability it gives the designers to suggest issues and perspectives for consideration without uh, imposing solutions. And I think this might be useful in this context. There are three, I'm going to introduce three forms of ambiguity that might be useful in this context. Ambiguity of context being the first. Now, ambiguity of context can question the discourses surrounding objects, allowing people to expand, bridge, or reject them as we see fit. Uh, blocking the interpretation of a product in terms of an established discourse creates this ambiguity of context. And this is useful in spurring people to approach, uh, to approach a particular system with an open mind, and more generally to question the assumptions that may hold about a particular matter of concern. The example I'm showing here um, is of um, Dunn and Ray again, their Energy Future Lunchbox. They as designers, we're interested in um, us, become, us users becoming responsible for our own energy production. They were looking at what was going on in the development of the microbiological fuel cell, 
a battery that basically breaks down new, uh, organic matter to create potential, to create energy. So essentially, you can use your human waste to power your television. Right? The technology is there. This, 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 is, this is there. So they propose this object, this lunchbox that you bring your lunch to, uh, to, um, to work with um, in one, one side. And then you take the waste. Sorry, I touched my bottom. You take your waste home with you um, to power your television. Now, the object, uh, they put it out there, they frame, they expect you to do this. This is, a, this is an object of design. Um, but what it does is it tests and it probes maybe the social, cultural embargoes that exist um, to this project actually becoming real. Um, and it's with this familiarity of form, this strangely familiar form. It's a lunchbox, but it's not quite a lunchbox that sort of sets up this, this space to, to question and to have this sort of this, 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 this exchange. Um, another form of ambiguity that's employed in this context is this relational ambiguity. Um, relational ambiguity can lead people to consider new beliefs and values and ultimately question their own attitudes. Um, it creates the condition for a personal projection of, an imagine, of imagined values. Um, and this allows products and systems to become psychological mirrors for people, allowing them to position their values and activities. This is a project um, by Bjorn Frank. Um, what is it? Any, anyone want to have a stab? Kit of transfer bruises. Kit of transfer for bruises, yeah. Any, anyone else? I, I think uh, he, he suspects it's a love bite from another man and he's beaten up. Yeah. Traces of imaginary affair is the, is the project. So it's a, it's a kit that lets you self-harm in ways that makes it look like you are having an affair. <laughs> um, what do we think about that? Stalkers. Huh? Stalker. This one. Stalker. Stalker. Any other, anyone else from the... Jealousy kits. Jeal yeah. Trying to get, if you, you know, messed up, messed up perceptions of how to make oneself, make someone appreciate you more, yeah. Yeah, desire for attention. Yeah, that's it. So, if if in um, in would we would we collectively agree that this is a ne this is negative connotation? This is a negative thing. No, they're using it as that. There is it's ambiguous, isn't it? Because it's a negative thing, but as that's why I said messed up um, sort of way of thinking that you might get someone's attention as they yeah. articulate it. That's it. So if it serves sort of this sort of, you want to feel desired, you want that, you want to feel self worth and valued, and it lets you. And sort of hiding these things from your partner has can have this can have this 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 could have positive effects. I don't know. Um, but at the end, but the, the, the sort of the, the fact that we bring our percep our perceptions, our position in the interpreting the object and talking about the objects starts again creating the space where we might sort of have different sorts of conversation around the objects. Um, Finally, uh, in, the, the, in this, this sort of uh, overview of ambiguity in, in a critical design, I want to talk about uh, ambiguity of information. And I'm going to do this in reference to Erica's project. Erica, a fantastic MA industrial design student, graduated a couple of years ago, sitting next to Praz, another fantastic industrial design student. Are there any other industrial design students in here? Zhao, yeah? Um, also fantastic. Um, Erica's project... Um, uh, is looking, <coughs> let's talk about ambiguity of information first, okay. Ambiguity of information empowers people to question for themselves the truth of a situation. A number of tactics are used to enhance ambiguity of information. These focus on creating and reflecting uncertainties about, it, about information that are noticeable to people. The purpose of this may, me, may be merely to make the system or seem mysterious or impressionistic. But more importantly, it can also compel people to join in the work of making sense of a system and its context. So we've just heard from Adam talking about sense making. This ambiguity of information uh, functions to sort of allow people to start making sense. So in Empathology, the project by Erica, uh, Erica was working with um, uh, people with uh, mental health issues uh, and the families of uh, people with mental health disorders, uh, the carers, the family members. Um, and what these ambiguous objects do is they, they function as probes that allow, that are generated out of, con Erica generated out of conversation with, the, with, uh, with this community. But they also act as probes for discussion 
about issues of mental health. And Eric is going to show you more about this later, so I'm not going to dwell too much. But it's in this sort of, uh, this sort of communal sense-making, these conversations and interactions, where there uh, is space for empathic exchange, I would argue. Um, so, purposeful ambiguity that creates a dilemma of interpretation through critical design practice can be useful. Um, it can empower people to question the truth of a situation. Uh, ambiguous objects can act as mirrors that allow us to question our own values, attitudes and belief. And this might have restorative potential. Um, this form of design can act as an interface through which one might interact and begin to understand the perspective of, of the other. Um, first step in maybe cognitive empathy. Um, and critical design uh, in this context have this infrastructure and agency. Uh, Adam and, uh, has talked about uh, design things, Thomas is in the room, uh, this, this infrastructure, this idea that you put an object or a thing there, and the interactions that are had and, and what forms around that object is, is a useful thing, and that can, that can affect change. Um, so maybe this is sort of what a critical design practice offers, um, this, this, this sort of the, 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 the topic or the context that this workshop's exploring. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there.